this evening, we are privileged to have a man who in his ministry and academic work had devoted his, his years to this whole area of understanding Pentecostalism, charismatism, prophetism, and all that to help us understand how we handle issues about uh, some of the, these days we want to call misleading theologies, prophecies, and uh, uh, some of the abuses also we are witnessing. How do we respond to them? Viewers, we are privileged to have Reverend Professor Kwabna Asamoah Jedu. Prof, welcome to What is Next. Thank you. Help my viewers to know who is the man behind Professor Kwabna Asamoah Jedu. <laughs> well, um, I'm a, my, if you want to know a bit about my background, my parents actually come from Kwapim Latte. So I'm a full blooded Latte man. Mm. Um, I was born there. Um, and my parents' homes were just about four blocks away from each other. Mm. So they lived in the same community. But I did not grow up there. Uh, unfortunately, I can understand the language. Everything you say in Ghana, I understand. Mm but I can't articulate. I'm trying to learn the language now in my adult years. Um, so although I'm from, Latte, I'm from Latte, I grew up in the twin cities of Sekandi Takradi. So I usually tell people I'm from Latte, but I have a, a sentimental attachment to Sekandi Takradi because that's where I grew up. Most of my childhood experience come from there. Uh, most of my friends come from there. I attended Fijai Secondary School. Um, so um, I claim these two, if you like, a heritage of, of, of two, two towns or cities, if you like. Um, at the moment, as you know, I am the president of the Trinity Theological Seminary. Um, it's been a, a rather long journey. Um, if anybody had told me, maybe in my formative years, that I would one day come to head the seminary where I also trained, I probably would have told the person that he or she was a false prophet. Mm -hmm. But you know, I see this as a as a God ordained um, journey for me, and um, I feel very fulfilled and pray that I'll be able to serve God's purpose and my generation in what He has called me to do. Uh, for those of us who teach at the seminary, we are also pastors. Mm -hmm. Every Trinity faculty member is also an ordained minister. I'm an ordained minister of Methodist Church, Ghana. And at the moment, I also serve as the pastor of the Asbury Downwell Church, which is a, a non-denominational congregation, uh, but it has a very evangelical orientation. Mm. So um, in brief, yeah. um, that's, that's uh, so, some more. Viewers, <laughs> we have the president of Trinity Theological Seminary with us. This evening. Now, Prof, growing up, what were some of the values that shaped your worldview, your professional life, your Christian life, other things that you don't want to let go? Things that you don't want to let go. Thank you for the question. Um, my parents were not people of substance, materially speaking. Um, sometimes I share snippets of my background with my students. Some of them believe it, some of them don't. Um, my parents are not people of substance. Um, but I tell people that they, they gave us two things. My father gave us two things. First, my father gave us God. He showed us who God is. Prayer was very much a part of our, our growth. Um, my wife will tell you up to today, my regular waking time is 4.30 a.m. And it comes from how I was brought up. My father brought us up to wake up early 
And that testimony must be given by your wife. To pray. For she's the only one who can give this <laughs> <Exactly>. testimony. <laughs> to pray and then to work. Mm. My mother was a homemaker. She was a very hardworking woman. And she got us um, to do little economic things as we grew up. So uh, as a boy, I sold everything from sugar cane to uh, used clothes and so on and so forth. So I've grown up on the streets, more or less. I, I tell people there is no corner of Takradi I don't know, mm. because I used to sell all kinds of stuff. But uh, my, my life was very much a life in the church. Mm. So we grew up, the, the children's service that I grew up in was very, very well organized. But in those days, the Takura, the Bethel Methodist Church Sunday School had two sessions, one in the morning, one in the evening. Mm. The morning one was structured like a normal school, mm. but focused on the Bible. So we studied the Bible and we write little um, short examinations and mm. so on. Um, I am sure that they wouldn't mind for me to mention their names. There are a lot of Christian leaders in this country that people may not know, but we grew up in the same church. Um, if you go to um, a place like Lighthouse Chapel, they have a very outstanding pastor called Kakra Bading mm -hmm. and his sister, Mrs. Hayward Mills, and others. We grew up in the same church. So we're brought Hayward up... Hayward Mills must be Mrs. Hayward Mills. Yes, Mrs. Hayward Mills, okay. yes. You know, so... And the foundations in the Bible were very solid. My own father and two senior brothers were also Sunday school teachers. And they brought us up in the Word. And then in our teenage years, we also joined Scripture Union. You know, so Scripture and a life of high moral temper has been part of our upbringing, you know. And when I look back, I look at the people who, as it were, uh, whose teaching, whether in the secular school system or in the Sunday school, uh, helped to form us. You, you look back with, with great gratitude. I, Maybe, uh, but then let me move you from there. Mm -hmm. Are there such people that publicly... Uh, maybe you have done it how many times, but publicly you on this platform want to acknowledge hmm. uh, uh, people have been like mentors, yeah. you are saying secular or church, that just to say thank you to one or two. I know you can't do all, but if there are one or two, publicly you want yeah. to acknowledge and say thank you. Well, from my primary to middle school years, um, I still recall the influence of one teacher called Aqua. Um, I don't know whether he studied music. I don't recall that he told that he studied music. But in addition to his normal teaching, you know, he's the one who introduced us to singing of hymns. Mm -hmm. You know, and almost every week you will learn a hymn, the whole school. And somehow he was able to teach all the parts. You know, every now and then, we still meet when I go to tell credit. Then in my uh, middle school years, there is a particular female teacher called Mrs. Mary Makuvia. We are still in touch. Oh, great. And she was one of the most outstanding teachers I met. Took a very personal interest in my, in my life and career. To the point that even when I got married, my wife and I spent our honeymoon with her. Mm. Uh, she was teaching us at Kosombo then. And recently, during my investiture as president of Trinity, she was there. Mm. It, it, it tells you how much of a part of my life she has become. So there are these people, uh, Sunday school teachers. I still recall Mr. T.K. Mensa, who became headmaster of um, GSTS in Takuradi and a number of others who um, took us as, you know, they became godmothers and godfathers uh, in the church as we, as we grew up. So that sort of relationship continued. And then, of course, uh, my, my mentors at the seminary. Um, in those years when I entered Trinity as a student in 1983, we had very senior uh, professors there. Uh, Reverend Dr. Sam Prempe, Reverend Dr. Sam Asantenchi, 
I was much younger. I think I was one of the youngest, youngest in, in the student population. So they looked quite old to me. And then in my second year, three um, new lecturers joined the faculty. Um, the late Reverend Professor Kwame Bediako, then Reverend Professor Emmanuel Lati, who now teaches at uh, Emory, University, Candler School of Theology at Emory, and then our former presiding bishop, um, the Reverend, the most Reverend Dr. Roberta Bajimensa. Mm -hmm. They joined the Trinity faculty. And they were a little younger than the ones we met. So each brought uh, his contribution. But I tended to gravitate towards these younger ones because they had also come from a very strong evangelical heritage. Mm -hmm. So I thought for the first time in my life, I was seeing people I wanted to model my life after. Mm. Strong evangelical Christians, good sermons they preach to us, good family life, but also strong academics. So I like the way they brought their Christian faith as evangelicals into the classroom, you know, and that balance was really appealing for me. Mercifully, I also became their. I, I also became their son. So uh, viewers, that's, that's how I was. I'm focused. having a conversation with uh, Reverend Professor Kwabra Samwaji, the president of Trinity Theological Seminary. This is what is next on GTV, the authentic, and trusted voice of Ghana. Prof, is there anything we can identify and call misleading theology in the church? Well. Um, yes, there are theologies that are misleading, but I wouldn't even start from the church. I would start from the times of the Bible, because one of the reasons why God, for example, called Abraham later becoming Abraham, giving him specific instructions why God gave Moses the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is because he did not want his people to be led astray. Anything that is inconsistent with the mind and character of God as revealed in Christ, you would say is misleading. So, if you ask me, yes, there is theology that can be misleading. And if you look at the prophecies of Jeremiah, for example, Jeremiah 23, God outlines what it means to be a false prophet. And a false prophet, in that context, is one who has not been in counsel with God. Being in counsel with God is waiting for him to receive from him to give to the people. But if the prophetic utterance comes out of your own imagination, you can lead people astray. And we don't realize the gravity of what it means to call yourself a prophet. Because once you take that tag on yourself, you are literally saying, I'm communicating to you something that I've heard from God. And the people who believe you will also think that what you have asked them to do is from God. So if it goes wrong, it can go horribly wrong. And I have seen people who have been giving wrong prophetic direction, who have taken decisions that have affected even their business, their marriages, their education, and so on. So these are not things that we got to joke with. But you talked about prophecy in the church, and I'm trying to say, it, uh, uh, you talked about misleading theologies in the church, and I'm trying to say, we have to go even further back. Mm. In fact, I made a presentation recently on misleading theology, and I was saying that when the serpent approached Eve and Adam and asked them those questions, whether God had asked them not to eat of a particular fruit. The serpent was trying to lead them astray. The serpent pre presented a misleading theology. Hmm. So that's where it started. 
We will come back to that presentation. But is misleading theology deliberate or accidental? Do people just sit down, plan, I'm going to do a misleading teaching, understand? Oh, they are doing good things and then they reach a point and accidentally. Uh, how, how does it happen? It could be both. It could be both. Both because you can have someone who truly and genuinely believes what they are teaching in, although they may be wrong. And then you can get those who are preaching or teaching for selfish reasons, for material gain. So when you have people like that, they will deliberately distort the truth in order to achieve a certain purpose. So you can have both. That's why in the scriptures, those who teach, if you read Paul very carefully, those who teach are usually required to educate themselves. And when I say educate themselves, it does not necessarily mean going for a theology degree. If you want to teach God's word, you must be up to teach it. You've got to be somebody who has educated himself in scripture. But not just that. You must be accountable. Those who handle or divide the word of truth must hold themselves accountable. Those who prophesy must be accountable for what they say. You can't say that this is what God asked me to say, so I have said it. If you look at the way Paul described prophecy in the New Testament, especially the place where he said that when the prophetic comes out, say, in tongues, and there is nobody to interpret, then you have to keep quiet. It does not mean that a person who is prophesying cannot interpret. God is able to do all things. But Paul was calling for accountability so that you don't use the prophetic to cast insinuations in a very cynical manner in the church. So the Bible itself has inbuilt strategies and directions and teachings that helps us to be accountable to each other. And when you are accountable, it means you have people who watch over what you are doing. And I remember there was a church that was going to hire a pastor. And I told them not to hire the pastor, not because the pastor is not good. Because at the interview, the pastor could not tell me who he was accountable to. Mm. And anybody who is not accountable to anyone, you should watch before you hire them. Recently, you, you gave a keynote address at All Africa Conference of Churches mm. In, in Kenya, Nairobi, yeah. on the subject misleading theology. Mm. Now, is this a phenomenon you are describing? Is it a Ghanaian problem? It's a world problem. It's a world problem. Wherever God's word is preached, the danger of distorting truth. So when I was asked what is misleading theology, I was asked to define it. And my definition of misleading theology is this. Any teaching, prophetic utterance, declaration, that is inconsistent with the sovereignty of God and the supremacy of Christ is misleading. Mm. So whatever you are declaring must be consistent with the character of God as revealed in the scriptures. And the end game must always be to affirm the supremacy of Christ. So when I'm listening to a prophetic declaration or a preaching or anything, I ask myself, what, as a theologian, I would say, what is, where is the Christological element in all this? Where is Christ? Because it is Jesus Christ who defines the faith. And so when you are doing or saying anything, that is inconsistent with what Jesus has told us to teach. And here, the Holy Spirit comes into the equation. Jesus says that when the spirit of truth comes, he will take that which is of me and make it known to you. So the Holy Spirit then becomes the revealer of the truth of Christ. 
And so if what you are teaching is inconsistent with the character of Christ, then there's something wrong with it. It doesn't matter how well it sounds. But recently, Benny Hinn, they're very, yeah. now you are telling us that some of the things we are witnessing in this country, all the prophecies and who die first and who, mm -hmm. that not a, a new is everywhere. Yeah. Benny Hinn, mm -hmm. international renowned evangelist, mm -hmm. came out that what he called pro, uh, prosperity gospel. He has outlawed it that the gospel is not for sale, and so he won't preach it again, and it should not be preached. Now, will you describe this man of God who has touched lives, his teaching, the, the prosperity gospel, mm. as a misleading theology? Well, I, I don't have all the facts surrounding the declaration that Benny Hinn Evangelist Benny Hinn, Pastor Benny Hinn, whatever you want to call him, made recently. But I was very saddened by it. I was very, very saddened by it. Because, you see, you ask the question whether misleading theology or misleading teachings of the word is deliberate or not. And I said it can be both. It can be both deliberate or not deliberate depending on the motivation that a person has. The reason why Benny Hinn's denunciation of prosperity teaching saddened me is that almost 30 years ago, one of the most popular exponents of the so-called prosperity teaching, Jim Baker had a big problem in the US. Mm -hmm. All these teachings about God wants me to put up a big this, a big that, we call them grandiose schemes in the name of God. It landed Jim Baker in prison. It was in prison that Jim Baker learned his lesson. And when he left prison, the first book that he wrote is titled, I Was Wrong. And he goes into detail why all the things that he preached, that God wants us, the, 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 the Christian should be the richest person. He even thought that there is nobody in the church who must be richer than the pastor. The pastor must drive the best cars. The donkey on which Jesus rode to Jerusalem was supposed to be the Mercedes Benz or whatever of his day and so on and so forth. Jim Baker, in the book I Was Wrong, denounced all that. And this is documented. It's a book about twice the size of an average Bible. After that, Jim Baker wrote another book titled Prosperity and the Coming Apocalypse. Hmm. Doing the same thing in showing us why the things he preached were wrong. When I heard Benny Hinn this year, I asked myself, what did you learn from Jim Baker? What did you learn from Jim Baker? So that was the first thing that saddened me. The second thing that saddened me is that we have an example in the Bible, Zacchaeus, who made his money the bags of other people. <laughs> and when he was confronted with the truth, Jesus Christ, he did what I would expect anyone to do in that kind of situation. I don't know whether Ben is going to do that in future. And publicly, if you like, apologize for the people that are led astray. But let me put my own twist on that matter. Increasingly, I am beginning to move away from the expression prosperity gospel. My personal and candid view is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of prosperity. The Bible does not glorify poverty. It, it enjoins us to take care of the poor. But poverty itself is not a virtue. And if we have the resources, we must fight poverty 
with all the resources we have. And Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have life in its fullness. And I'm certain that he wasn't talking just about life in eternity. God gave us the world to enjoy it. Enjoy the work of his hands and enjoy it responsibly. So God wants his children to do well. God wants his children, if you like, to speak in modern terms, to flourish. When we are students, God wants us to study, to do well. I was talking to some students and I told them, God did not bring you to the university campus to be a pastor. Nobody will give you a degree for evangelizing. So your first call is to study and get a good degree. If you have time during your studies and you want to preach the word of God, that's fine. But don't make that your preoccupation. Because, that's all, because God wants his children to come out with top degrees and do well. What I think we should call that message is the gospel of materialism. So what has come to be known as prosperity, prosperity gospel, gospel is materialism. Now, only want to talk to your colleague church leaders mm. that at least you are introducing a new conversation as far as that subject is concerned. And, and let's hear and, you and, more and, on and, that. and the conversation is that the Bible does not, the Bible is not against material well-being. There's a difference between having material things and being materialistic. Mm -hmm. I think Christian leaders have become materialistic and we take the Bible and use it to reinforce our material lifestyle, materialist lifestyle. And that I think is what Jesus spoke against. Jesus, to be materialistic is to handle material things as if they are ends in themselves. So I am never impressed with any preacher who spends time talking about his or her material acquisitions in life. I was on board a flight once, and I usually travel economy. That's what the people who invite me can afford. Mm. So I was sitting in the economy class when I saw a man I know. This is somebody who is a top notch businessman in this country and he has the wealth and I saw him coming I thought he was going to greet somebody in economy but when he came he sat there in my imagination he had made a mistake because <laughs> such people don't travel economy but anyway he sat there until we arrived in Accra and of course he he we know each other so i i talk to him and so on and so forth you see this is somebody who if he wanted could have traveled business class or whatever but for some reason he decides to travel economy so i don't see why when a pastor travels first class he should make it the theme of his sermon <laughs> you see because if that is how you want to use your money, don't present that as part of the gospel. Your materialistic choices should not be presented as gospel truth. And when we go to church, when we are preaching on television, we must understand that the people who are listening to us, some of them may perhaps be poor until they pass. The world is made up of people who are rich and people who are poor. And those of us who carry the word of God must be able to preach such that those who are not so materially well resourced would not feel that God has shortchanged them. Some people are not people of material means, not because they are lazy, but maybe because the, the, the background they have, they didn't have the resources. I say that some of the people who sell or peddle all kinds of things on the street, for some of them, if they had had half the opportunity some of us had, they would have done better. Mm. So we don't have to damn them. 
If God gives you material things and God blesses you and you have uh, uh, children, you are able to educate them abroad or give them the best, thank God for it. But don't make that the standard of everybody. That is not the gospel. Prof, mm. you mentioned something very important. You used Zacchaeus. In scripture, mm. when people know that they've made mistakes, mm. they don't just say, I'm sorry. There's also restitution. Yes. Now, when men and women of God mm. find out that we've made mistakes, mm. how do we make the correction? At the moment, in the name of God, in the name of miracle, people's marriages are, are, are breaking mm. apart. Mm. And how do we get our colleague pastors even to admit that in the effort we are making, we can make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, maybe these uh, 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 the, some of the steps we can consider. Mm. You touch on Zacchaeus, but I want to know more how to do, you know. Well, one of the major signs of a man or woman who is filled with the Spirit of God is that there is one trait they will always have. They are always humble. And humble people are the people who readily admit their faults and also would like to do something about it. Mm. See, we can correct some things, that some mistakes that we have made in the past. But we can't correct everything. Mm. For example, if a young man is growing up and the young man decides that I'm going to be amorous and has children over, all over the place with different kinds of women and so on and so forth, how do you correct that? But the lessons you learn from it and how you use that to educate people so they don't make the mistakes you, make, you made, that is what is important. You know, so when people have made mistakes, say somebody has taught a certain line of doctrine and you come to the point in life where you realize that, no, this thing I have been teaching, I think there's something wrong with it. As Jim Baker did, he has written about it, he has apologized, and one of the stories that he tells in the book, I Was Wrong, is how he met a young man in prison and wanted to know what brought the young man to prison. And the young man said, well, I was listening to a preacher on television, and the preacher said, if you sow 10000 in my ministry, $10,000, this is an American in my ministry, God is going to give you 10 times that. And he went to take out a loan and send the money to the preacher. And he couldn't pay. And that's why he's in prison. Mm -hmm. And Ben Hinn writes in that book, that preacher could have been me. Oh. You know, so we have used God's word wrongly. And we have wrecked people's lives. When you come to that realization, I think you should do what Jim Baker did. And I hear he's now involved in community work, helping ordinary people and reaching out to people who in the past would not be able even to go near him. Now, one of the things I said about misleading theologies in my presentation in Nairobi was that this matter is not about Pentecostal pastors or charismatic pastors. No, it affects all of us. All of us, whether Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Catholic, Pentecostal, everyone. Christian leaders, especially in our part of the world, have adopted a certain model of leadership that is not Christian. Mm. We have adopted a chief executive model of leadership. People now have to wait on pastors. It's the same thing that James and John wanted to do when they came to Jesus and asked, can one of us sit on your right, the other on your left? Jesus called the disciples together and told them, the leaders of the Gentiles lord it over them. And the expression that I like in that passage is where Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. I'll hear you more about this. But viewers, I'm in conversation with Professor, Reverend Professor Kwabna Semwa Jedu, the president of Trinity Theological Seminary. And he has raised some very important issues when it comes to Christian leadership, that our model should be different from what others are presenting. At least 
we should not lord it over them. But, Prof, 31st December is coming. And now the billboards have started. Mm. Cross over, jump over, fry over, walk over. 31st December night. You are the man training pastors for almost all the churches in this country. Do we have special visitation of God on 31st December night? The story you asked, the, 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 the question you are asking me is like the question that the Samaritan woman put to Jesus. Is it on this month or in Jerusalem? <laughs> <laughs> I think as people who believe in Christ, who are under the new covenant, we know that God's visitation is a daily visitation. There is no particular time, moment in life that you say this is a, a special day. Every day is special to God. So that, I think we must get straight. But when we are standing on the verge of saying goodbye to an old year and welcome a new year, it offers opportunities and possibilities. I believe very much in the resolutions that people make if they mean them. If they mean them. If they mean them. So it is not a modern phenomenon. In fact, the watch night service was instituted by John Wesley. Oh. So it is something that he mandated all Methodists, all the people called Methodists to observe. Because it was a night. And he called it watch night. Watch night. It was a, a night of prayer, of repentance, of dedication. And if you know what is at the heart of Wesleyan theology, it is scriptural holiness. So Wesley wanted his people to rededicate themselves to a life of holiness as they entered the new year. And the Methodists have carried that to this day. Of course, the Methodists church or the people called Methodists do not have sole custodianship of 31st night. So I think that it is good that churches take this seriously. After all, when you go to other countries, 31st night has been reduced to voyeurism and drinking and making merry and, and just wasting um, the night away. I studied in the UK, that's why I did my, my doctoral studies. And as somebody who has been part of Watch Night Service in Ghana, now I was looking forward to 31st night. I went to church, there was nobody. There was no service, you know. So I'm very happy that this has gone beyond Methodism and almost every church. Look at the way our dear brother, uh, Minister Otabel, for example, packs their across post stadium on Watch Night Service. Young people, you know, every Methodist church, you find people Presbyterian, Anglican, you know. So I like the fact that we, it has become a night in which we draw people's attention to the importance of resolving to leave the past behind and enter the new year working with the Lord and so on. I think it's a good thing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Christianity is gradually becoming commercialized. And any time religion is commercialized, it competes with secular commerce. And that's where advertising comes in. So now people are advertising. Of course, we are in a media age. So we can't do without advertising. This program that we are on was advertised on social media and so on and so forth. You know, we have to be abreast with developments in media technology and make use of it, even in the church. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But the problem is where Christian leaders put themselves at the center of it and arrogate to themselves the power to determine what happens to people. And even those who do not have any prophetic gift bend over backwards to try and be prophetic in the way they do things in order to give the impression 
that they hold the destiny of people in their hands and so on. Rough. Now, yes. if we go to the streets mm. of Accra, mm. Ghanaians are uh, some Ghanaians are worried about these death prophecies that come on 31st December. Mm. Such people who are worried and showing concern are they wrong? They are not activity? wrong. They are not wrong. We must challenge those kinds of positions. Last year, for example, one pastor was prophesying the death of this former head of state, the death of chief imam, and, and things like that. That is why I started by defining misleading theologies as any teaching, preaching, declaration that is inconsistent with the sovereignty and supremacy of Christ. Where in the scriptures does Christ mandate the Christian leader even if, even if the thing has been revealed to you, what purpose does it serve to use that watch night service to make it public? In any case, if God revealed it to you, did he also tell you the platform on which to reveal it? So this has become an exercise in, if you like, um, it, it, it's become a very egoistic exercise in which people try to put themselves forward and let the public think that they are more important than they are. So we have every reason to be worried. Only recently there's a, a Christian organization that is trying to think through making regulations on how churches must organize themselves and so on. One of my own submissions at that meeting was that there is nothing that pastors are doing that is not governed by law. So if a pastor makes declarations on television, there's something called verbal violence, and we think that the person is out of order, the law must make it take its course. You know, so it is something to worry about. And I am praying that, especially the, the, the churches that belong to ecumenical organizations, at least by this time, will issue pastoral letters to all their ministers, all their pastors. Prof, you are here. They, those people are not here. Okay. Will you use this platform mm. to talk to Christian leaders and church members mm. that we are just getting closer to Christmas and 31st? Mm. What should go into a pastoral letter getting the church in this country ready for some of these excesses? Will you talk to our viewers? Well, my dear viewers, my thinking on this matter is that all the ecumenical bodies in this country, by which I mean the Christian Council of Ghana, the Catholic Bishops' Conference, the National Association of Christian and Charismatic Churches, the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic um, Council, should work to write a pastoral letter to all their ministers, all those who belong to that organization, that the watch night service is not the time to deceive people. It's a period in which people must assemble in churches or whatever location that they assemble to pray, seek God's face, thank him for the past, and pray and commit ourselves into his hands for the future. Incidentally, the year 2020 is going to be a critical one for us. We've all been talking about corruption in this country. We've been talking about even deception on the vertical front. And this is something that pastors must not only preach about, but also pray about. So that God will give us honest leaders, that the election itself will be, will be free and fair, that those who win, um, will know that they have been called to serve God's people and those who, live, who lose will be humble enough to accept that they have been defeated. So these are the things that I think we should pray about and get individual members, inspire them with hope that maybe the year that is past did not go well in certain areas. You inspire them to resolve for themselves and their families to do well as they go forward, mm. so that people will leave the service knowing that indeed the Lord has visited them and spoken to them. Mm. I don't think that is a place to go and predict 
the death of politicians and so on and so forth. And church members who hail pastors who do that as the most anointed of God should stop. Because people who are genuinely anointed of God are people who have been in counsel with God. And these are not the kinds of things that God revealed to people to speak in public. I am a Methodist, but I don't, I'm not ashamed of saying that I take a very um, charismatic approach to my faith. So sometimes you have dreams, sometimes you see things, you visit the people, pray with them, and say to them that I was praying about this matter, and God revealed this or that to me about you. Whether it is true or not, I don't know, but I think that I should let you know so that you pray about it. Mm. God gives us wisdom even to know how to reveal things to people. You know, so we shouldn't use the church platform to make ourselves more important than the gospel we preach. That is what I think happens on 31st. That people want to appear important. They want to appear as if they have privilege to God's presence. Nobody has that privilege except Jesus have Christ. Yes. <laughs> Special privilege, no. God's presence. But we are all welcome. Exactly. This is what is next with Professor, Reverend Professor Kwabna Samwajidu. Prof, recently, mm. Mr. Samuel Amut Tobin, mm. the CEO of Tobinko Group of Company, was here. Mm. A business person, of course, a Christian. Mm. He attended a funeral, saw a woman dancing, and then he said, what you are discussing with that god spoke to him mm. that go model a program around this dance mm. and it will be something big he came and that is uh diasa mm. that recently even has won an award mm. and bringing women who might have gone back mm. because of maybe their plus size when it comes to prophecy, does God speak to us only uh, church people? Of course, you said that we should stop who would die first, who would die second thing. But does God speak to us matters of governance, uh, entertainment, economy, environment? Do we get prophecy, prophetic utterances that go beyond the individual self, even to the bigger, the larger society? I would think that the problem is our very narrow definition of the prophetic. We have taken the prophetic to be something that is declared when the speaker is ecstatic and who has come under some kind of uh, special anointing as we describe it and so on. But that which the Bible calls prophetic could come by enemies, just like Nathan, the prophet, walking to David the king. And the courage with which he went should tell you that this is somebody who was truly and genuinely inspired by God. He did not go to tell the king what the king wanted to hear. He told the king what God wanted him to hear. And you saw the result, read Psalm 51, and you see how what Nathan said brought David the king. To repentance. The prophetic can come through the message you are preaching. If a preacher waits before the Lord in prayer, takes the word, soaks himself or herself in the word, and mounts the pulpit or the platform to preach, the sermon itself can be prophetic because God will take aspects of the message and bring it to people in a way in which the preacher himself may not even have an idea. So don't let's limit the prophetic to people who make declarations of what is going to happen today or tomorrow. Because after all, traditionally, we have said that the prophetic consists of both foretelling, which is declaring the word of God, and foretelling that is saying something that is going to happen in the future. But the one word that I like us to underline when it comes to the prophetic is purpose. For what purpose did God reveal this? If you look at it that way, then I would say yes. The prophetic must speak to every area of our national lives. Recently, one of my colleagues at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences gave a paper. You were a member of Ghana Academy. I'm a fellow. Yes. A fellow of Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
She gave a paper, and I like the title of the paper. It was a question. Is Ghana on the verge of ecological suicide? Look at what we are doing to the environment. And the church must be prophetic in that area. Because our lives and the lives of our children and our future depends on the environment that God has delivered to our church. Look at what we are doing to our mining areas. Look at what we are doing to our forests. And the thing that gets to me is when we play politics with it. When we go to a place where the water bodies have been destroyed and we tell them, when we come to power, we will allow you to do it. So, we are destroying ourselves. And then after that, we are in church praying. Look at our sanitation situation. Filth everywhere. People come to this country. Every so many meters, there is a church. And the churches are engulfed in filth. How many of us, as Christian leaders and pastors, preach about hygiene and sanitation? We have become specialists in preaching about money. I'm doing some work on money now. And the way it has come to dominate what we preach. Of course, money is good. We need it, we need it to live. But we do it in a way that amounts to exploitation. That's how prophecy is being used. I have seen this or that about you. And if you bring this or that amount, I have had to deal with a very difficult case in which a woman who claims to be a prophet went to a business, another woman, a businesswoman, says, I have seen this and that about you. A few of the things she said coincided with some misfor a misfortune that had happened in this businesswoman's life. And said, bring so much money, at that time it was about 3,000 3, CDs, I'm going to pray for you. Then she came back, she returned for another 3,000, that mm -hmm. the people I, who are praying for you, I need to give them some of the money. It was after giving the two tranches before she told me. And I told her to tell the, that so-called prophetess that if she doesn't return those monies, I'll get her arrested. This, this exploitation. But she had already collected 6,000. I'm telling you, all in the name of praying for somebody. You know, so our, our prophetic mandate is to every area of our lives. You can't, when you have employment, Joke with your work. Go to work anytime you like. Close anytime you like. And then on Sunday you are in church praying for breakthrough. God doesn't work, work like that. And I told somebody recently, God doesn't reward laziness. No, then God it's like you are not spiritual. Way. Are you anointed? I am very Pastors much. like <laughs> you. <laughs> Maybe you are not spiritual. <laughs> you you know. So we, we need to let the word, the prophetic word, Speak to every area of life. When people come to church on watch night service, encourage them to live, encourage them, give them hope, but also challenge them to change their ways. We must challenge them to change their ways. Viewers, I must go back uh, to the producers. We will need Reverend Professor Kwabran Samuel Jedu uh, another time, likely same time next week. So this is what time will allow us. But we have a long way to go uh, 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 with Professor Samuel, especially as we are getting ourselves uh, closer to the end of the year. We need to get ourselves ready. Get ourselves ready for some of the essences. Get ourselves ready for some of the things he's telling us as we enter into 2020. So I will not ask him to give us his last word. We will meet him again, same time, uh, next week. This is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. May God bless our homeland Ghana and make this country great and strong. Prof, we are grateful. Most welcome. Thank you. My, my privilege and honor.